Hey everyone, how's it going? This is Finite MTG. Uh, this time we are back with another Master's Edition flashback draft. Um, <laughs> changing things up a little bit today, I'm going to be recording over a draft I already did. Uh, unfortunately, I was in a public place and I could not record audio, uh, but now I'm in a private one and I'm free to blab as I please. So this pick is gonna come down to the Cabal Ghoul, three mana, one, one, uh, and you can put extra counters on it as other creatures die. Um, I think it's worded at the beginning of each end step, put plus one, plus one counters on it equal to the number of creatures that died. Uh, that card might be really good, but I think I'm just gonna take Lightning Bolt, um, assuming that Bolt is the better card. There's also a Phantom Monster, very good card, four mana, three, three flyer. Um, but the problem with Phantom Monster is blue is a pretty shallow color, so it's really the only blue common that's good that you're gonna see. Um, in this pick, Got a couple options. I'm looking at Fisher. I'm looking at the Lemure, five mana, four, three, which can turn into a five mana, three, three flyer, at the low, low cost of zero mana. Uh, and then there's also a five mana, two, four death touch as an honorable mention, but I'm just gonna snap up this Fisher. Uh, goes well with my lightning bolt. And one of the things I've noticed about this format is because you are so low on playables, it's best if you can commit to a color combination early. So we're going all in on red here. Throughout this video, I mess with the card reader a little to try to make things easier. It doesn't always work. All right, I'm not gonna try to say that first word, but the second word is witches, and those witches are super good. Uh, it's just a two mana one three pinger. Yes, your opponent does have the ability to ping as well, uh, but a lot of the X ones in this format are not particularly good, and a lot of them end up in your deck regardless. Uh, the witches are very good at taking those out. It's also uh, like an effective combat trick. You just have to make sure that you're not putting yourself in a position where your opponent can blow you out uh, by activating the thing's ability. Uh, the other drawback right now is the card is a double black two drop, but it was just easily the best card in the pack for me, so that's why I took it there. Uh, the last draft, or no, maybe two drafts ago, I had a deck with two of them, and it was insane. Uh, opponent just couldn't play any X2s, and of course, because the witches themselves have three toughness, uh, it's just so hard to deal with them. It's not like you can uh, ping your opponent's two toughness creature and they can ping one of your witches thinking that uh, it'll die because of course the three toughness keeps it alive. All right, Clockwork Beast in this pack. Uh, another big guy in the Shambling Strider right underneath it, but this is effectively a six mana seven four. When you attack a block with it, it shrinks a little bit, but um, after that you can actually tap it a bunch more counters on it uh, but what's most important to me here is it's just a big idiot uh, yes it shrinks a little but it doesn't totally matter uh, six mana seven four is just good enough in this format the creatures are so underpowered oh interesting here um, I'll have to come back to this moment later there's a greater realm of protection or something right next to the Phyrexian war beast that I'm picking uh, but the Phyrexian war beast is a very good card three mana three four um, unfortunately, when it leaves the battlefield, so not just dies, but also if it's exiled, you have to sack a land and it deals a damage to you. Uh, but again, one of the great things about picking up these, um, <laughs> about picking up these beasts, actually, uh, is that they are not committal. So right now, uh, if I end up in black, I can play the beasts, even if I don't play red and vice versa. It's just totally, uh, totally fine to take these kind of medium creatures um, in terms of how we would look at them nowadays. Okay, interesting pack here. Uh, Darylor is a card that I initially liked a lot. Uh, four mana for a 4-4, four, four, but the drawback is actually a little worse than you might think just because black spells cost an additional black. If they cost an additional one, I don't think it'd be the end of the world, but a lot of the double black spells like the witches are already, again, hard to cast, so I think I'd rather just have a 5 mana 2-4 sort of uber death touch here in the Thicket Basilisk. Uh, now, this is a pretty bad pack. I really don't like Hungry Mist. Um, I think it's the best green card in the pack, but I think it's just not a very good card, so I believe I take the Ication Town out of this one. Yeah. Um, but the Thicket Basilisk, that's a good card. We saw a Lanawar Elf and another Basilisk earlier in the draft, so there's a possibility I'm supposed to be red-green at this point. Um, of course, we've seen virtually no red cards since the second pick, uh, but that's okay. 
um, signals are not exactly a bound in this kind of format. And so now I make um, kind of a tough decision, but I think it was definitely the right one, uh, taking the bestial fury here, or bestial fury maybe. Um, so two and a red for an aura that cycles, so it's already okay. But then whenever a creature becomes blocked, the enchanted creature that is, it gets plus four plus zero and gains trample. Uh, and that happens to be super good with instant speed removal. If your opponent blocks, you can kill the stuff before damage happens, get that plus four plus zero and trample, basically an extra four points of damage. Um, and it commits me to red a little more. Here I'm taking the Hungry Mist. I don't think the card is good. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's playable, but I'm taking it here just because I think there's literally nothing else. And as you can see, I try to make that clearer by putting it directly into the sideboard. Uh, this pack has virtually nothing going on, but the goblin here, I'm not going to try to say that second word either, uh, one mana zero two, and it's basically like a dauntless bodyguard, that kind of effect. Um, yeah, here I can just take the scrib sprites, not because I think it's good, but if I'm forced to play green, I can have a second green unplayable here. <laughs> uh, because after this pack, things are looking a little tough. Uh, there's a Gazban Ogre. Uh, that card has not been particularly good for me, but I'm not sold that the card is bad yet, uh, so I'm, I'm willing to take a look at it. I think the card would be better if there were more pump spells in the format, but meh. I think the card is interesting nonetheless. <clears throat> All right, so in this pack, uh, we're looking at Juzam Jin um, as our rare, and it's a pretty good one. Other notable cards, there's an order in black, uh, also an order in white. Those are just premium two drops. Um, probably see like uncommon power level if they were printed now. Uh, Exile, very good card. Bintorn Elves, um, but otherwise, oh, and also Roots. Roots is okay, um, but I decide, you know what? Green was a little bit open toward the end of last pack, but a lot of the cards were unplayable. Black was almost not open at all, and so I'm kind of counting on the idea here that red and black are gonna be much more open in this direction. Um, this time I'm taking the Lemure over the Fisher, uh, kind of the opposite pick that I of the one that I made second, where I took the Fisher over the Lemure. Uh, but this time it's because uh, I've got a little bit of removal and I just could use some more threats. I want to commit in that way. Um, now there's a Fisher. Definitely going to take that. Um, and it's looking like I'm going to be able to get away with playing red black here. There's an Onulet in the pack as well, as I'm about to point out here. I'm definitely playing that one if it wheels. Um, there just isn't enough card quality in these packs that you can afford to be picky about that kind of thing. Got a kind of an interesting pick here between Eater of the Dead and Order of the Ebon Hand. So Eater of the Dead is effectively five mana, three, four Vigilance, but it's actually somewhat better against effects like Paralyze, as I learned the hard way. Um, Order of Ebon Hand, though, uh, I make the decision here just purely based off of curve. I have one two drop right now, so the order ended up being quite good for me, as I'm sure you'll see. Um, but yeah, card is a little rough on the mana, but it's just a good card. Uh, taking a Phyrexian War Beast here over the Mountain Yeti, which is the best card for me, I believe, other than the War Beast. Um, there are two good green cards in this pack the Singing Tree and the Thorn Thalid, as I point them out. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about how I would love to play a Mountain Yeti in my deck, but I'm a little low on threes. Mountain Yeti's rough on a mana. Uh, and it actually, it could have been the correct pick here in hindsight, but um, War Beast it's going to be for me. Um, makes my deck a little more aggressive, uh, makes the mana a little bit better. In this pack, the only real card for us is the Erg Raiders. Uh, some other cards are Roots and Yavi Maya Ants in green. I think Roots is playable. I think the Ants are pretty bad. Goblin Mutant is kind of atrocious, uh, but I'm going to be pretty happy here with an Erg Raiders, or as I like to call them, the Erg Rowers. Huh. All right, well, if you stuck with me after that terrible joke, I, I applaud you, because that was, that was a pretty bad one. But I mean, it's an Erg, right? Like, they have to... That's what you do. You row on an erg. Everybody knows that. Okay. So here we have Fisher number three. We're starting to get a ton of the removal. 
again, Onulet is a good card. Um, not good as in like actively I'm willing to put it in my deck, but um, it's better than some of the other garbage in these packs. But five mana removal, not to mention at instant speed, is just a little too good to pass up on. Super happy about this late Mountain Yeti. Easily the best card in the pack. Um, just goes straight into the deck here. A little bit of remorse maybe passing the other one earlier, but pack two is really, really saving my deck. Um, I think every pick has been just a good playable. Um, yeah, and so if you're playing 23, 24 cards, you're going to look for about eight playables per pack. Uh, we're at 15 right now, getting closer to the end of pack two, so we're really not super far away. Uh, we could even just get eight playables in the next pack and be done. Granted, uh, <laughs> you know, this format, you want to seek out playables where you can, um, just because it's so hard to uh, get enough cards that don't suck. Okay, so this pack, um, there's basically nothing going on other than a Bestial Fury number two. So Bestial Fury number two it is. I think the card is solid. I don't know if I would play a third or not. Uh, here I'm looking at these two cards. Uh, I'm not sure which is better. I'm thinking about taking the Artifact Blast uh, just as a decent sideboard card. And I decide at the last second, you know what? I'm gonna change my mind, go for the shield. Uh, I think because Artifact Blast is a common, I'm going to be able to get other ones. We wield an Onulet. That probably should not happen just because, again, there are not enough playables. Artifact Blast. Sure, we'll take it. And we're going to <laughs> try to show you guys the text on that one a little more clearly. Counter Target Artifact Spell. What is going on? Is this Planar Chaos? Like, why is Red able to have a counter spell? Um... We are going to take the Dust to Dust here, which actually is not bad against us. It's another little bit of foreshadowing there, just because we had the three, four artifacts so far. Double War Beast, uh, Onulet, Clockwork Beast, and the uh, even the Shield of Ages in the sideboard. So this uh, pack is not the best. Uh, we are looking at some medium statted creatures. Um, namely the uh, Stone Giant Dragon Engine, but the card for us is going to be the Lemure, just another 5-mana 3-3 three, three flyer. Uh, that's a good threat in this format. Uh, it's no Phantom Monster, but one of the good things about taking a Lemure instead of a Phantom Monster is black is just so much better of a color than blue, again, um, that you're, in my experience, willing to pay that extra mana for it. Not to mention, the cards uh, trade a lot of the time, and mana isn't the most important thing in this format. Um, seems like the games <laughs> drag on for a little bit. Uh, so I briefly consider rare drafting this moat, because who doesn't want to rare draft a moat, right? Uh, I realize it's not on the right thing, so we have to sort by price. And I find it at 20 cents. Pretty good stuff. So... These drafts are low value, and when I say that, I mean like absurdly low value. Like, either you get a force of will that pays for just over two drafts, or you get like almost nothing. Um, so I'm strongly considering this Pyroblast as just a high pick sideboard card over the Dragon Engine because Dragon Engine is just not the card I really want to second pick out of a pack. But um, I'm looking at my playable count. I'm thinking about the Pyroblast. Pyroblast is almost definitely a more powerful or effective card. It would have been a good card for my sideboard, but I decide, you know what? I need the playables. Can't really afford to gamble in this format, so just going to suck it up and take the Dragon Engine second. All right, Goblin Wizard, 4-mana 1-1. One, one. That's not the way to go, not even in this format. Uh, so for me, the pick is between Mind Stab Thrall and Paralyze. I have not played with Mind Stab Thrall at all. I think the card is fine. I don't think it's particularly good. I think the mana constraint is kind of a problem too. Um, but we're gonna take the Paralyze here, uh, especially because the deck is slanting aggressive and getting in for damage while we can is important. Okay, so two good black cards here. Order of the Ebon Hand, once again, and another Lemure. Um, 
I'm just gonna take the Lemure though. Okay, this time uh, a couple more cards. Darylor, we already know what I think about that one. It's just a little too awkward for my tastes. So we're gonna take the Erg Rowers number two. Got a whole team of these guys. Um, this pack is basically a giant blank. <laughs> so we're gonna take the Artifact Blast number two for the sideboard. On uh, hindsight, maybe Knights of Thorn uh, would have been a good hate draft because I don't really need two artifact blasts and because Knights of Thorn with Pro Red is pretty good against like my Fishers and Banding is just super obnoxious. Okay, Phyrexian Boon, this is our first uh, hard black removal spell, not counting the Paralyze, of course. That's why I said hard. Um, and that's important again for cards like Knights of Thorn with protection from red. Uh, it's also a really late removal spell, 3 mana for basically uh, kill, an act, kill a non-black X2, should not go that late in this format. Uh, and at this point we're at 23 cards, we're basically just done here. Uh, we're going to look at these last few cards, but as usual they're going to be <laughs> borderline unplayable in almost every color here. Uh, so 2 mana, 2-1. Two, Our deck is actually pretty good. Uh, we don't need two mana two ones. Uh, take a Thrall Retainer here if an opponent has a lot of destroy removal, but that's not going to be necessary either. Uh, goblins of the Flarg or Flarg or whatever. I'm thinking about taking it, and I decide, you know what? I think I'd rather just hate draft a Psychic Venom a card that can actually be pretty annoying um, than just take the goblins. I think there are some super aggressive tempo decks in this format. Uh, something like Psychic Venom can actually just be super obnoxious. Okay, in this pack, uh, there's another Goblin, and we're going to take the second one, but it's not going to end up in the main. Uh, the Transmogrant is a close, uh, close comparison, but I think I'd rather just have the Goblin. Um, basically, I think putting a plus one, plus one counter on something is just a worse onboard trick than being able to regenerate. Uh, now we're going to hate draft the Arcane Denial because it's the best against us. And take Bestial Fury number three. Uh, kind of like the second Goblin Chirurgan or whatever. Um, not going to try to play Bestial Fury number three. Um, just comes down to how many creatures I have as threats. Like if I remove the Goblin from the uh, deck that we have right now, we only have like 14 creatures. Uh, and we have the two Bestial Furies, so really no need to try to um, go all in and enhancing and protecting our creatures. Okay, so just going to be a straight up um, add nine mount nope, <laughs> add nine swamps and eight mountains, uh, take a screenshot of the deck, and that's, yeah, that's going to be it. Um, it lo might look a little more, a little heavier uh, red than black, but I'm glad it added nine swamps just because we do have the order and because uh, two of our double black cards are two drops. So if we can have double black early, that's better for us. And we're into the queue. All right, we're back with round number one. Opponent gets to be on the play here. And we've got a beautiful mulligan to start off with. And this hand, um, got three five mana cards and two lands, but unfortunately uh, we're going to have to keep. Uh, it's a tough choice between the Bestial Fury and the Fisher, one of the two Fishers to put to the bottom here, but I'm going to go ahead and bottom the Fisher just because Bestial Fury cycles, and if we don't draw our lands, we're going to need help. Um, and we draw a Swamp, so one interesting consideration here is actually playing Swamp first, just in case I top deck one of my uh, double black two drops. That said, I still have Lightning Bolt, um, and by playing Mountain I'm able to represent that. Not totally sure if I should have played Swamp regardless. It's pretty unlikely I bolt something on turn two, and opponent is missing lands already. <clears throat> so now, right on time, we draw the Witches, and we have our second Swamp in play, still holding up the Lightning Bolt. And opponent continuing to miss land drops here. 
Um, so now one of the things I'm thinking about is whether or not they could have an unsummon. Um, so I'm just going to attack first and see if they are interested in unsummoning. And they're not going to, so we're just going to go for it. It's a one for one trade if they bounce here anyway. Um, they didn't do it because they didn't have it, which means now we draw a card and if they don't hit a land yet again, then suddenly they're discarding the hand size. And unfortunately for them, they're discarding the hand size. So that's a breeding pit into the graveyard that makes some zero one tokens on their end step, but forces them to play uh, to pay double black to keep it alive. So now we get to run out the Lemure with a little bit of a fear of arcane denial, but um, not too much. It's still a nice two for one, even if they have that. Uh, and because they didn't, now we have some board presence. We can start clocking them. They did just hit their third land drop, so we're going to try to close out the game as soon as possible here. They go with a uh, Homerid spawning, which notably only lets you sack blue creatures to that. It would be kind of insane. Maybe it wouldn't be insane with spawning pit, but it would be kind of... <laughs> interesting with spawning pit if you could sack any creature but how this ends up working for them is uh <laughs> i think at some point maybe it's next game uh they seem to have read it as if it says um sack a creature and they tap double blue and then untap <laughs> so we just run out of war beast uh we're clocking them for five a turn no reason to give the lemure flying here they can't block anyway And they just scoop it up rather than take a hit for eight next turn not to mention the bolt in our hand um, so maybe there's a target or so for the artifact blast maybe there's an argument for bestial fury number three but we really didn't see enough to have any idea of what to change so i think i'm just going to run this back they showed us two enchantments one that they discarded and one that they played um, and of course, red, black, not very good at dealing with enchantments. So keep that in mind when you're playing this color pair. Uh, not to mention, I think there might just be no enchantment removal in the set. Uh, like Oubliette, which is kind of a black O-ring, works a lot like hard removal, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out a good place for the, <laughs> uh, for the uh, card reader thing here, which of course is only marginally larger than uh the rest of the cards and i just can't figure out a good place for it which is pretty funny and i decide you know what I'll just put it somewhere off to the right over here opponent goes turn one bobble and cracks it what are we playing modern or something um I'll give you a hint we are not so this time i'm definitely leading with swamp uh we have another black source in hand, another two actually, and two double black cards we can top deck. That's not one of them, but we'll play it anyway. The Erg Rowers, gonna come in and try to pressure them. Um, kind of like the uh, Gazban Ogre, whatever it's called. Uh, this thing is a little bit sketchy as an aggressive threat, um, and I end up <laughs> getting punished pretty badly here by this Paralyze. Um, so Paralyze, you have to pay four to untap the creature. Um, and then Erg Rowers, if you don't attack with it, then it deals two damage to you. So basically my opponent is like two for one in me. They have given themselves sort of an unblockable 2-2 and taken away my threat. So that's kind of a blowout there. Blowout there. Just something to keep in mind. Uh, fortunately, they're not playing much in the way of threats themselves. Uh, and keep in mind with Paralyze, you can only untap during your upkeep, which is why I couldn't untap it there. Um, okay, another Shadow. Uh, this card has been pretty bad whenever I've seen it. I've yet to see it come back from a graveyard, so it's just a 2-mana 1-1 one, one haste, and that is not a playable card. Um, so now we are just going to untap the Erg Rowers. There's not anything else we're doing with our mana. Um, not this turn anyway because I don't really care about holding up Fisher, can't play the Clockwork Beast yet. So now uh, there's an argument for playing Paralyze on their nether thing, but I'd rather save that for a real threat. They have one. 
Uh, they chump the war beast, not super surprising. They take two, which means I am not taking two because I attacked with the Erg Rowers. Okay, they go for an Oubliette. That's kind of a blowout as well. They get to get rid of my War Beast. And again, because it's a leaves the battlefield trigger, even though it's getting exiled, um, as opposed to dying, I still have to lose a life and sack a land. Sacking a land, of course, the relevant one here with a five and a six drop in my hand, but nothing I can do about that. Uh, so I'm still gonna pay for the Erg Rowers here. They are not putting anything on the battlefield. There's nothing I can play from my hand. Um, so basically we're uh, every turn we're going four mana we gain two life they lose two life which is maybe not the most efficient card to play every turn <laughs> but eh, you got to do what you got to do sometimes okay they go for a breeding pit here that's going to be super annoying for me because uh, they can just start making tons of zero ones and the zero ones can just chump the erg rowers so I don't have very much of an incentive to keep on tapping that said, I still pay for it here. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and paralyze the uh, order as well uh, because now they have to pay double black every turn for the breeding pit, so they can't really afford to pay for the order, um, which means we get to keep attacking with the Erg Raiders because they can uh, eventually give the order uh, plus one, plus zero, <clears throat> and that would just trade for the rowers or even plus one plus zero in first strike. So naturally they do chump uh, with an O1 there. And now that we have six lands, uh, we're planning on just playing the Clockwork Beast next turn, uh, letting the Erg Rowers stay tapped and ping us for two. So they make an O1, they do nothing, two cards in hand. Uh, I'm a little bit afraid of a counter here, but I decide I just can't afford to play around one. So we're going to run out the beast. Uh, Witches, very good draw here against the O1 they're making every turn, and their 2 1 they have tapped. They do have a counter. I actually forgot they had the counter there. Um, and we take the 2 damage. So right now it looks like a losing game for us, but keep in mind Arcane Denial is a 2 for 1 in your opponent's favor. Um, so now. They draw one card, but we draw two. Basically, again, uh, your counter spell trades for the thing you're countering, but then Arcane Denial lets your opponent draw two cards, or the controller of the spell, I should say, and then whoever played the Arcane Denial can draw one. So if you can counter your own spell with Arcane Denial, you can actually draw three, which is pretty cool. Really gradual uh, card advantage, but card advantage nonetheless, if you're able to counter your own spell. So now they have the Homered, uh, whatever, on the battlefield, and uh, we are not going to pay for, we can start playing, um, or do I pay for? Yeah, actually I do, and the reason why is because I can still uh, play one of my double black cards here. If I had quad black, then I wouldn't do that, but uh, as it is, I just go for an attack here. I hope that they don't chump. Um, and that's why I'm playing the Witches post-combat, because again, if they don't chump here, then I can just shoot, uh, shoot down that Thrill. And, yeah, they pass the turn, unable to sack their Thrill to the Homerid spawning bed or whatever. And I think it might have been in this spot where they just conceded, which is kind of weird because it's not like they're imminently dead. But uh, yeah, they gave up. I <laughs> pretend to click on the reveal hand button there because my hand is pretty excellent at that point. Like we have the Juzam Jin. It's going to come down. It's going to mess up my opponent, but they already had enough. So that's good for us. All right, round number two. This one's going to be a little bit more interesting than round number one. Um, got a nice mono red hand here, two mountains, four red cards, and an artifact. And that's going to be a keep, even though, again, two fives and a six with a two lander is a little bit scary. All 
All right. So we get to hold up the bolt, which is nice. Um, here, might as well go for a swamp. No real reason uh, to play the swamp or not to play the swamp here that I can think of. Maybe it's better to play mountain just because it gives them less information. But they go for a 2-1 that can uh, gain mountain walk. And against my deck with mountains, that's a 2-1 unblockable. No thank you. So that one gets bolted away. They go for a card that I am pretty sure is a 3-mana 0-1. And uh, <laughs> you can read the text box there. And I think I zoom in on the card for you guys as well, because I'm kind of in disbelief that uh, my opponent just has a straight up three mana zero one in their deck. And it's not a straight up three mana zero one, but it's not a card that should be in your main deck. Like, look at this. Gain control of target creature whose controller controls an island. I do not control any islands. So that's a three mana zero one. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess they can gain control of their own creatures. Seems pretty bad to me. Uh, so they, they go for a Suchi here, which is actually a rare. Uh, it's Cathodian's big brother. If you know anything about Cathodian, you know that I would say, um, or at least if you know anything about what I think about Cathodian, you know that Cathodian is labeled with upside. So Suchi, that thing is terrifying. Get that out of here. Four mana, four, four, make four mana. They don't even take four damage from mana burn. Broken. So instantly fissuring that. We've got a Clockwork Beast lined up for next turn. Uh, and that's a good one for the Bestial Fury as well, just because it has so much power. Uh, a lot of opponents are inclined to chump block. Opponent passes with five mana up. And so second time playing Clockwork Beast here into just a ton of mana. Uh, remember Clockwork Beast uh effectively a six mana seven four there we go i hover over it um and it shrinks after combat after each combat that is where it does something uh, but then you can grow it again so it looks like the opponent is just reading it here if i recall correctly they do not have a counter for this um and i'm not sure if arcane denial is the only counter i suppose they could have hard cast force of will which would have been pretty funny a uh, nice $30 card there, but no counters, which I'm happy about for sure. And they go for a Vesuvan uh, Doppelganger, I believe. Uh, five mana clone. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you get to clone something else if you'd rather do that. Um, and so something pretty cool about uh, the Doppelganger here, if I let it live, they could, um, if there was another creature on the battlefield, a a larger one for instance they could clone that and then they would keep the seven plus one plus zero counters from the clockwork beast but we're just going to fissure that thing right away attack for seven really hoping that they don't chump it here because um if they don't chump and then they're thinking about chumping in the future in the future we'll have bestial fury to basically take chumping off the table for them but yeah they just went for a one blue blue uh gain seven life there which is not actually the worst <laughs> a lot better than a one blue blue for a zero one normally um and so here i'm starting to think about exile i believe and exile the namesake card for the uh the text the exile zone um it's just two and a white uh, exile, target non-white attacking creature, and you gain life equal to its toughness. So, um, unlike the black removal in old sets, it doesn't say non-artifact. It's just non-white, and of course all the creatures in my deck are non-white. Um, I actually go for a Bestial Fury here, hoping that they're going to uh, bounce it in response so it doesn't get exiled. Um, because again, that's just a one-for-one -one trade, and yes, they do get some tempo. Uh, but that was my thought process. I actually think this was a poor play. I think what I was supposed to do here uh, is because I did have a pretty good read on the Exile, I think. Um, and I actually have one in future games as well. Um, yeah, and so now here I am hovering over the lands, 
I'm saying, hey, look at their hand, they're going to have the exile for three mana. Um, but regardless, what I should have done here is I should have saved the Bestial Fury for my War Beast, which I should have played, um, both of which I should have played post-combat, because they do have a 1-4 in play, and I don't want them to just be able to block infinitely uh, my 3-4 with their 1-4. So yeah, I think that's a misplay. I should have held that Bestial Fury. Um, I'm not sure if it ends up being a big deal or not, but I, I noticed that afterward. I was like, oh, why did I do that? Um, they go for a really weird card here. Five mana, three, four. Um, and if you can guess the top card, or if someone can guess the top card of their library, they get to draw it. If they don't, it has to be milled. So I think actually what you're supposed to do with that card, if you're going to use it, is target your opponent. Uh, because it's really hard to choose what card is on the top of your deck uh, unless you have some kind of combo or uh, like for instance I think Sylvan Library is a rare in this format so that would be disgusting um, but another way you could do it I mean you could just guess lands which is like the safest bet um, it's also a small set meaning that if you have multiples of a bunch of things um, your chances go up a little bit uh, but again 5 mana 3 4 like if the card had flying it would be really good but instead it's just kind of like a medium playable and it's tough to cast so i don't know something like a five mana three four that can gain vigilance i think that might actually be a, a better card that black uncommon that i passed during the draft <clears throat> okay so we uh get the combat trick onto the battlefield opponent attacks us for three not really sure what's going on with that, so we're going to block. Don't know about any combat tricks that could get me here. Also, I have Fisher available as well as the um, sort of Dauntless Bodyguard effect in the Goblin. So the creatures are going to bounce off each other. And the opponent realizes that <laughs> I am not afraid to block. Uh, though I am getting punished a little here, I suppose, for not having the uh, Bestial Fury on the War Beast. We do get to play a Witches. Uh, and of course, now it's almost as if the War Beast had a Bestial Fury on it because if they block with a Tortoise, we get to shoot that Tortoise. Uh, we take one damage for our troubles, but um, yeah, okay. So now they go for uh, a Phantom Monster, and unfortunately, like we can kill that, but they might have more where that came from. Uh, so I decided I'd rather just get aggressive here. Um, especially now that I drew the witches, basically I just, I can attack. Um, one trade they can make if they want to coming up here is with the phantom monster. Uh, but even if they do that, I have the onboard dauntless bodyguard effect. Uh, but really what I'm trying to do here is just reduce their life total. Uh, so they go ahead and activate the, the white rare <laughs> and it does about what I expect, which is they try to draw a card and instead it mills them. Um, so I pull up the game log here to see what they name. Uh, I think they take like a long time to do this too. All right, well, they named Phantom Monster. That took a while. And they hit Exile. Um, hopefully, I'll have edited that out for you guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Fisher is going to resolve. It's going to kill their thing. They basically just milled a good removal spell. So, punished. <laughs> Um, now we attack with 3-4, time to get aggressive, they block with the tortoise, presumably not remembering that the witches are on the battlefield. Uh, that said, they're in a tough spot because we do just get to start pinging down their stuff. So we just kind of one for zeroed them there, killed one threat without spending a card. Um, so now I think they're going to start hitting me for three. Ooh, yeah, the dust to dust. That was brutal. Uh, I was trying to allude to that one earlier in the draft. Main deck dust to dust, which I think is frankly pretty absurd. Uh, even if I could sacrifice something or whatever, uh, because it has two targets, it would resolve, and I can't sacrifice anything there anyway, except for the goblin. So now we are back where we were before, not in excellent shape, until I top deck the Lemure 
top of uh, my deck was very kind to me this game. And that's effectively Phantom Monster, or at least able to trade with the Phantom Monster. Uh, and because I have that Goblin on the battlefield, it's really as if I have two of those things in play. So now, <clears throat> I think the opponent must forget about that here for a second. Um, oh, I'm there. What I'm trying to show is I sacked um, I sacked a Swamp to the uh, the War Beast when it left the battlefield, but I was supposed to sack a Mountain because I don't have anything that cares about having a ton of mountains. But I do have the uh, two mana two one. Uh, Knight of the Ebon Legion or Hand or whatever that um, does care about how many swamps I have. And so yeah, I'm effectively... They top deck another Phantom Monster. Uh, unfortunately for me, it's as if I'm able to have one of my own. So at this point, I am not trying to race. Um, I could attack with the Lemure, uh, but they have three mana up, one card in hand. They showed me two exiles already. It's unlikely they have a third, but it's not impossible. Uh, so I'd rather just try to make this trade on defense. Um, and if I can discourage them from attacking, that'd be great. Um, so now I have Mountain Yeti in play, and the Mountain Yeti, uh, as well as the Erg Rowers, which I just drew. I mean, that one's not in play, but the Mountain Yeti uh, kind of like the War Beast can attack into the 1 4 uh, because of the Witches. Uh, the Mountain Yeti has Mountain Walk. They do not have mountains, but it does have protection from white, which means even if they do have an exile, they cannot spend it on the Mountain Yeti. They're just going to lock down my. Uh, lock down my Lemure, which I think is like a thousand percent incorrect. Yeah, I think it's about a thousand percent incorrect. What they should have done was attack with the phantom monster, then uh, I block, and then they go for a telekinesis, uh, and basically they're just able to take my flyer off the battlefield. Um, now they top deck another phantom monster, because why not? Uh, and I top deck another Lemure, because <laughs> we're just about equally lucky here, uh, except I didn't misplay with my combat tricks. And so now what I go for is actually, I decide, you know what, um, now we're racing. I probably should have played the Erg Rowers before, uh, but I play it now because uh, it's just another threat to have on offense here. Um, and even though they have some 3-3s three that, on the face of it, the Rowers cannot attack into, uh, the Witches do allow me, allow me to make that attack. The Witches are just MVP this game, super, super important, along with the Mountain Yeti too, but... Uh, okay, so the opponent makes the extremely strange play there of not attacking with both 3-3 flyers when they're currently ahead in the race. So I have to crack back with my ground creatures. They make the logical block. Uh, keep in mind we are not activating witches here because we're currently losing the race. They block and unblock a mountain yeti. Doesn't really make sense to me. I don't know what they're afraid of. Um, just because one of my Lemures is still locked down and my life total like could be so much lower than theirs. Yeah, but they still, they are not on the attacking plan. Maybe it's just because they're flooding out and they're afraid they're not gonna be able to close out the race. Um, but I've decided it is time to attack. So we're just gonna send everything other than the Witches, uh, which means really they do not have favorable trades, not playing around exiles anymore. Uh, a couple times they went down to zero cards, I think. So yeah, I'm just gonna make some trades. These trades are definitely good for me. I have three creatures to their one, and now I'm in a place where I can start activating the witches. Keep in mind the tortoise cannot attack. It turns into a one one if it were to attack. Um, and yeah, now, now we're just gonna be able to win the game here pretty easily. So some questionable plays from the opponent, some good draws on our end, not to mention another Lemure here. Uh, that's just brutal. I don't know if I should have attacked with the Witches or not. Uh, I remember they figured out they could block the Mountain Yeti, which I think actually just did not change the math. Or um, no, actually it was better not to attack with the Witches 
because then they have to block the erg rowers and then I can ping them and they take four instead of three. So that was a mistake. Um, they play a five mana three one, which is pretty hilarious with my pinger on the battlefield. So we're gonna go for a ping. Why not? They'll ping me for one. And again, the witches just almost single-handedly winning me this game combined with drawing all three of my Lemures here and figure might as well tap down their thing, go for lethal. 14 cards left in each, in our, uh, each of our decks and at long last, the game is finally over. All right, in terms of sideboarding, um, my options are going to be pretty few just because there are not very many playable cards here. I'm um, thinking about the Shield of the Ages as a way to fight back against like phantom monsters that I can't block in case I don't top deck all three of my Lemures next game, um, considering another Bestial Fury. Um, I think I do go with the Shield here just because the rowers, the Erg rowers that is, are not particularly uh, useful in this matchup. Um, I'm not sure if that was correct or not. I don't really know how good Shield of the Ages is. I think it has a place, but um, they also showed me the main deck Exile 2 Artifacts. Or wait. I think that was this match? Yeah, I think... Yeah, they showed me the main deck Exile 2 Artifacts. So boarding in another artifact does kind of make things worse um, in that way. But I felt it was just better enough than the rowers that it was worth it. And yeah, I'm just like fawning over the witches there. Just completely insane card for me last game. Helped that I never had a one toughness creature on the battlefield for them to kill. <clears throat> so another beautiful mulligan here. And this one is pretty ugly. Uh, two double red cards and four swamps. But I'm thinking about this, and I'm foreseeing a way uh, in which I'm able to win this game. And it involves drawing black cards and drawing mountains. It does not involve mulling to five. So I'm going to say, you know what? I'll take my chances. And the top of my deck is kind to me, once again. Top decking the order of the Ebon Hand. Maybe I shouldn't make it sound like I was that lucky, because I did have to already mulligan once and make a tough decision. Um... But it felt like I was pretty lucky at the time. Uh, but we... <laughs> they play a 1-mana one 1-1 one, one pro black. I play a 2-mana two 2-1 two pro white. Um, and mine, of course, is just better. It can gain first strike. It can be pumped. And feeling pretty good about the spot I'm in currently. So they go for the attack, of course. Uh, neither of our creatures can block the other, so no reason not to attack. Uh, I go for my attack, fully aware that they could have the exile, but this is my other pro-white creature in my deck. Uh, and so here I go for a pump, because why not? I'm not doing anything else. And they go to prevent the damage, which is not a terrible play on their part, uh, effectively gaining at least five life, I think. Not sure exactly how much, but a few. So, good tempo play. Um, okay, now we draw the shield, which is pretty funny, because they have a 1-1 one, one in play. <laughs> and uh, suddenly they don't have a reason to attack anymore. Um, we've got Lemure in hand, we've got Clockwork Beast, uh, and we've got Fisher. We are one mountain away from being able to play any of those cards uh, mm -hmm. with the last land being in our hand. So opponent is missing land drops. It's turn five. They only have three lands in play. And we draw Lightning Bolt. We are just going to be mana efficient and play the Lemure, hoping that they don't have a counter. But even if they do, um, the Arcane Denial is likely to get us to land drop number six or double red. Now they go for a Phantom Monster. Uh, they miss an attack for one, which is weird. And... Now, uh, I have the ability to double pump the order and lightning bolt the um, 
the phantom monster so just a really insane play in terms of mana advantage for me there i get to spend one mana to deal with four of theirs and spend another four of my mana getting in just for extra damage um now that they've hit land drop number four um the rest of the cards in their hand must have been spells i'm expecting more phantom monsters uh, they showed me at least two last game i think three maybe three or more so they do have another phantom monster and i have another fisher so if i just top deck any land i can pump my order uh only once this time but still kill the phantom monster and get in for a bunch of damage they're thinking about attacking with their uh one one they really should attack with their one one it's not doing anything one of my creatures is uh like they can't block it with the one one anyway and the other one gains flying but they're just missing some damage here uh so now we're just going for an aggro play rather than developing outer board by playing the lemur um didn't draw the land so we can't pump the order we can only give it first strike uh, but they still take five damage here going to eight and we're just super far ahead in this game clockwork beast and lemur in hand and remember we started out with a hand that barely looked keepable this is quite the turnaround um and things are just going nicely here for us so they leave up four mana <laughs> i am very suspicious of an exile so we just attack with our creature from uh with pro white so they can't exile it uh, and i'm thinking about which thing to play post combat uh and they go for a holy light so it does actually kill our order um but that's okay it's not the end of the world just a one for one trade uh it's kind of funny it does get around protection from white but uh, i think holy light is solid if you've seen my last video holy light was an insane blowout so i think depending on what kind of deck you're playing against the card can be like decent to like kind of insane i would start meaning one i think and i think i would like at least one for the sideboard too uh since we didn't see it last game it's um possible that the opponent did bring it out of the sideboard but we dropped the clockwork beast here they go for a giant tortoise still holding up that three mana for the exile so pretty telltale um but there's not too much i can do about that so i'm thinking about it we just go to combat and attack and fortunately i'm still able to give my lemur flying after attacking um because otherwise they just block with the pro black thing and then nothing happens and so of course they do go for the exile <clears throat> yep on the seven four fortunately they gain four life not seven and they take a few damage anyway um and there's not really any playing around the exile they can just leave it up forever so that's why i made that attack um but it did feel good uh like trying to strand their mana the turn before i think it was the right play okay now they go for a lemur of their own off of the Vesu uh, Vesuvian Doppelganger copying mine. And because I have that Paralyze in my hand, I can just tap theirs down. Uh, super critically, I can put them to three life here, meaning that either of my Lemures is going to be a lethal threat in the air. Uh, and this means they can play a Phantom Monster and I still have a lethal threat, or they can untap their, I don't know why they're activating their Lemure, just trolling me a little bit. Yeah, they're just trolling me. Hoping I click through combat or something. And so, yeah, I hit them to three. And now they have to basically top deck a Wrath of God. <laughs> or just a way to, like, remove both of my creatures. Or block one and remove the other. And it's just not going to be possible here. Uh, I think the opponent tries to untap their thing. Um, and there is actually one card they could have here, um, but they don't even let me see whether or not they have it before they concede. So they go ahead and they untap their Lemure. Uh, the one card they could have here is the Unsummon. Um, and what that would allow them to do is when I go to attack on the next turn, they're able to trade uh, their Lemure for my Lemure, and then they unsummon the other one 
and then I replay it, and then they need another thing to prevent uh, me from killing them. But they didn't have it, so that's the end of round two. We are now 2-0-4-0. Things are getting pretty exciting, and we'll see you back for round three. All right, we're back with round number three. <clears throat> we get to play first. Pretty good hand here. Uh, we are going to lead on the goblin and then play Erg Rowers turn two. Um, not totally sure whether it's better to do that than just play a swamp, but it felt mana efficient at the time. Like I could draw a three drop and then get rewarded for playing things this way. So, <clears throat> okay, we're going to drop the rowers now. and auto yielding to that ability. Not sure if that's correct or not, but it happens. They go for a two mana one, two, not a great card, but they can pump soldiers they control. Uh, now we have a free attack with the Urg Rowers, and then we can play Order of the Ebon Hand, which blocks their white stuff and is looking to be unblockable against them, which is pretty nice. So no blocks from them. Of course, that would be a chump. We're going to drop the order, and then after that we can uh, play a Bestial Fury on the Erg Rowers, and that's going to make it so even though it's forced to attack, uh, it can trade up with the opponent's stuff. They have a 3 mana 2-2 two -two flyer here. Also has First Strike, definitely a good card. Uh, I think that card is a high pick. Um, and we just get to go for a Fury on the Erg Rowers here and attack with both. Both of our creatures with two power, not the one with zero. <laughs> and just putting some nice pressure on the opponent. Uh, nothing they can do about this really. And they agree. Even if they go for a double block on the rowers, um, we're like two for wanting them and we have the goblin in play to protect our guy. Now they go for a Knights of Thorn. This is pretty annoying um, as it has pro red and I have two Fishers in hand. So even if I top deck land five, I can't deal with it. Um, I don't top deck land five though. And I'm still able to make some good attacks here. So saying I send the same two creatures as the last turn um, holding up the goblin's ability. And I'm still a little confused why, um, banding allowed my opponent to do this. Uh, but when I tried to do this last, it didn't let me do it. So what I try to do is, I mean, I would try to kill all of their stuff, right? I block the flyer first. Uh, I protect my guy, so it's going to be regenerated. So without banding, this would just be like a 3 for 1, but unfortunately they do have banding. So I'm only uh, trading 1 for 1 here. Yeah, so they're just able to assign all their damage to the 1-2 or all, all the damage that I would deal to the 1-2, which is not a great trade for me. <clears throat> and we drop Mountain Yeti, another amazing pro-white creature against them. So no attacks from them, even though I can't block either of their creatures, just because their life total is so much lower than mine, they feel they have to do something to protect it here. Um, and I think they go for a play here that does not work out for them. And this, again, is the kind of thing you should not do. Okay. So, yeah, I think what happens here is the trigger from my ability goes onto the stack and they respond to it. They should not do that. So if they pass priority and I pass priority, then they get it um, like even after I've passed. 
So basically what I'm saying is now I, I sort of get to wreck them here. Um, I mean, it's not completely wrecking them, but it's still not bad. Uh, where they could have maybe exiled uh, my Uruk Rowers if they had held up the mana instead. But going for the Holy Light was not a bad play for them. Okay, they go for another Knights. Uh, they're at 10 life at this point. We get to play the Bestial Fury there just to cycle. Uh, it's not insane. <laughs> uh, insanely good, given that so many of their creatures are white, they're not very likely to be able to block anyway. Uh, but they are down to 7, and we're drawing an extra card here. Might as well play out the land. And it's another Fisher. It's just another good draw here. They go for a Phantom Monster, and that actually gives me lethal here. <clears throat> because the Bestial Fury uh, gives me plus 4, plus 0 in Trample. Fisher kills a creature at instant speed. So as long as they go for the block, which they kind of have to here, then I'm able to get an extra four points of damage out of the Bestial Fury and just kill them outright. And of course, that's what happens here. Keeping in mind, they have two mana up, so they can't exile the... Uh, oh, it also has pro-white, so that wouldn't work anyway. But yeah, we get them. So now we are 5-0, feeling pretty good. 5-0 um, in games, meaning... Uh, we won our first two matches 2-0 each, and now we're up a game in round three. So one game away from the coveted 3-0-6-0. Um, combing through the sideboard a little bit here, trying to see if there's anything that I would want to bring in. Um, I think I decide I just haven't seen enough stuff to want to change anything. Um, but yeah, the pro-white creatures that game, the Order and the Mountain Yeti, were just super, super good for me. All right, so this is a keepable hand. Not a super exciting one, but not much of a decision here as to whether or not to keep. And drawing a solid three drop off the top, again leading on Swamp because we do have the double black two drops in the deck. And they play this card. <sighs> Prevents damage to them from black or red sources. A card that we passed during the draft. So I don't know if we were passing to them. That would feel supremely bad. But basically, as long as they have one and a white for each attacking creature that isn't colorless of mine, they can just prevent damage. So I have no outs to that enchantment. What I'm hoping for now is like Clockwork Beast plus a Bestial Fury maybe is going to be enough damage. But I'm just in a ton of trouble now. I play my Onulet. Um, they get to start clocking me for three. But yeah, I mean, this is like a circle of protection on steroids. It's just like protection from your deck, except for like four creatures that are colorless or whatever. And that's really just absurd for me. So I think um, I think this is probably an okay play. I don't know if it's correct or not, um, but I go for a Fisher on their turn here, hoping that they try to attack with the Knights in a band, uh, because banding generally screws people up in that kind of scenario. Um, basically just hoping I can two for one them, because I think I need to get greedy at this point so they go for another knights holding up one blue mana which if you remember the game before last if that were the unsummon it could have saved my opponent for at least one turn um again potentially a mistake to not think about the unsummon here smart for the opponent to leave it up and of course they're able to counter my fisher by returning the phantom monster to their hand so that's a good trade for them uh, even though they paid one mana, they're going to have to pay another four mana. Uh, so we're effectively even on mana. Um, it's a good trade for them just because Fisher is so much better than the Unsummon. So now we go for a Lemure, which I think is even a little better than Fisher. 
Um, I think that's true in general too. Uh, but the reason that I uh, second picked the Fisher over the Lemur um, was just because I wanted to cling to red. Giant tortoise, so two knights, uh, two tortoises. And we're pretty much at a standstill here. I'm able to attack with one of my Lemures uh, because they don't have the two mana to prevent the damage. Uh, but it's not like I can kill them very easily here anyway, so. <clears throat> I can't really play the Urg Rowers because the 1-4s uh, and 2-2s two with Banding will just destroy it, so no point. They draw land. Not sure why they played it out here, but they did. Um, and yeah, there's just nothing I can do. Like, I can attack for 3 and they can just prevent the damage, so that doesn't do any good. I could play the Bestial Fury, but I'm saving it for the uh, Clockwork Beast, hoping that we're able to draw that one. Giant Tortoise number three. <laughs> Starting to get a little bit absurd here. Extremely defensive deck on their part. And, yep, yeah, just a super fun board stall here. Now they go for a Phantom Monster which can trade with my Lemur, but other than that, I mean, there's like nothing I can do. I draw Paralyze. I think about going for that on the Phantom Monster. I decide against it because if I go for that on the Phantom Monster, they can just pay for it, untap it, and attack, and then I have to trade anyway, so I'm just losing two cards there for no reason. It's a good tempo card. It is not very good this late in the game. Very good, again, on the Erg Rowers. Yeah, so I'm just looking at this card and crying. Do not know how this is a card <laughs> that is allowed. Okay. So we draw the Phyrexian Boon, which fortunately is able to kill the Knights of Thorn. Uh, because it has pro-red, this is the only removal spell in our deck that can actually kill it. Um, that said... Even that doesn't give me much hope. I just can't beat this enchantment. Um, I'm still hoping for some kind of like clockwork beast into Bestial Fury, which is in my hand, into like Fisher on blocks to like blow them out. But it's just looking like it's going to be extremely tough right now. Still, even though uh, maybe for the sake of time, I could have scooped it up here. Um, I didn't just because really was hoping for that 3060. Okay, so we're going to lock down their illusionary forces um, with the paralyzed. The idea being that it's going to clock us for four every turn anyway. Uh, and we need to tax their mana, maybe force them to sacrifice it if we want to live. So they do have to pay five mana here, four mana for the Paralyze, and then one more mana for the Illusionary Forces itself. So that's another card that's not a terrible target for uh, Paralyze, but eh, there's only so much I can do here. Even if I kill the Illusionary Forces, I can't even beat their two mana 1-1 one, one Flyer Pro Red, which is pretty sad. I'm hoping I can top deck um, like a Lemure to block that, but... This is just a pretty tough spot. So I'm thinking about what to do here. I decide might as well go for Bestial Fury on the order because uh, I actually do have an attack with that. Um, it has pro white, so the knights can't block it. And then if they block with a bunch of tortoises, it gets to be a six one. And then I can like give it first strike or make it even bigger. They decide not to throw a bunch of stuff in front of the knights, which makes total sense. Uh, though we do get to hit them for some damage here. So we get to pump it three times. They're down to 15. Unfortunately, it does not really matter. Uh, they're still able to 
pay for the Paralyze and the Illusionary Forces. The card I draw is a Swamp, so not the most exciting. And now they even have mana up for um, preventing damage from the Order. Though, uh, oh, actually, I think that does work, right? I think I... Yeah, so what I was thinking here, I missed two things that were going on. Um, so I was like, my order can't deal damage, but the complex interaction that's going on here is my order has pro-white, um, so the enchantment they control can't target it, but their enchantment doesn't target. So uh, I just, <laughs> I forgot about the pro-white, but I also forgot that, the, that their thing doesn't target, and ultimately that makes things moot um i'm unable to get in for any damage maybe they wouldn't have seen it that could have been a reason to make that attack if they didn't understand how the interaction worked but i mean they would probably try so now they get to hit me for five down to three um they still have mana to pay for the cumulative upkeep plus the paralyze so at this point i'm just dead So they attack for the five <clears throat> once they <laughs> figure out how to. If they misclicked their forces, that could be a way for me to live. Now at this point, I'm hoping to draw like a fissure. Uh, and if I did draw the fissure, one interesting thing is I would play it on their upkeep uh, because it taxes a bunch of their mana uh, to pay for the forces and the paralyze. And then before they get to their draw step, I would be able to kill their thing. Take one damage from the flyer, hope to top deck a Lemur, probably still lose. Uh, but that was definitely game there. So Sword of the Ages, it's no um, Shield of the Greater Realm or whatever. That card is so stupid. Uh, or at least it was so stupid against my deck. Uh, but I figure I might as well bring it in, just like against the last opponent. <clears throat> Considering third Bestial Fury, and I think I ultimately decide against it even though Urgrower's number one is still pretty bad um, for this particular matchup. I'm just hoping for a draw similar to game one, where I can just play some pro-white creatures and they are not able to prevent damage from them. All right, so yes, I choose to play first. Uh, these games do go long, but uh, they end up being a lot about who has tempo in the early game as well. I would not recommend drawing first in this format from what I've seen so far. Though I could see a world where actually maybe you would want to draw first because the creatures are so bad and the removal so good. So now I get to lead on a war beast. They have the same sideboard card as the last opponent and uh, another card that i think one of my opponents was main decking so yeah i get to lead on a war beast here so something to note all three of my opponents played blue and dragon engine could have been that pyroblast so there's a chance it would have been a ton better for me uh for it to be that card that said, it couldn't kill the pro-red thing on their side of the battlefield anyway, so right now it's not super relevant. And I think Dragon Engine's actually fine. Uh, it's going to be okay this game. So we are taking three a turn from their flyers. They're taking three a turn from my War Beast. Uh, but one of us is in slightly better shape than the other. And I'll give you a hint, it's the opponent. They're a little bit ahead in the race right now. Giant Tortoise, Brick Walls, my War Beast, which is bad for me. Now I get to, I think, uh, attack with both and then go for a Mountain Yeti. And then next turn I go for Double Bestial Fury. Uh, different option here could have been Bestial Fury 
on the War Beast, but I decide that I think I like this line better. So of course they go for the 1-4 on the 3-4, and they take 1 damage. Giant Tortoise, not a bad card in this format, not at all. So now what I get to do is go for Bestial Fury on the Mountain Yeti and a Bestial Fury on the War Beast, and that's going to allow both of those creatures to get past the Giant Tortoise, and then the turn after that, I can start attacking with all of my creatures uh, because I can pump the Dragon Engine to get through the Tortoise. I'm also going to draw two cards off the Furies here. Meanwhile, the opponent is clocking me, and there's nothing I can do about it. They go for another giant tortoise, and I draw a mountain. I decide to go for a fury on my uh, yeti first, because if they have an unsummon, it's not as brutal as against the war beast, which makes me sack a land. Um, but I do go for the fury on the war beast as well. They have an exile on the war beast, so good my mountain. Um, they're still taking three, but I'm down to 11 life. They just gained four life, and they're hitting me for three a turn. I can't do anything about it. So my sort of red divination resolves here on their upkeep. Um, I have a Lemure, which can block their 2-2 first strike and their 1-1 pro red, but I'm afraid it's not going to be enough. So they hit me for another 3 here. If they wanted, they could sack one of their um, other creatures and attack for another 3, which wouldn't necessarily be wrong. In fact, it could have been the better play for them. Um, in fact, I think it would have been, actually, because it reduces their clock by a turn. But now we go for an attack with the Mountain Yeti, holding back the Dragon Engine to keep back all of their dorks. And now I go for Lemure, which I'm afraid is not going to resolve. And I'm debating whether to play the Paralyze or not, and I decide, you know what? I really need to preserve my life total. I think it's worth it to go for it here. So I do Paralyze eventually. I'm thinking about which one the Paralyze to, but I decide that uh, Paralyzing the Pro Red one is pretty bad because it's a good blocker, so I'd rather Paralyze the good attacker. So now I pass the turn. I think they do... They do something to my Lemure, I think. Yeah, okay, so just no plays there. Um, oh, okay, so I think what I do now, maybe, yeah, maybe I attack with the Lemure and it's like too aggressive or something. Maybe I'm just supposed to leave it back, I don't remember. Um, how I get destroyed here, but I do. I do play the uh, Goblin pre-combat, and a nice attack with everything here, uh, except I think I changed my mind on the Dragon Engine. They can just block with the Tortoise anyway, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, so now they block the one guy with uh, Pro Red, and they stack some turtles on it, and we get to regenerate it with the uh, goblin, which might actually, maybe that was wrong, I'm not sure. Um, but we do, we regenerate it, and it doesn't actually matter how we're assigning damage, um, because we can't kill two of their things anyway, but this is not the logical way to do it. Um, so I regenerate my thing, I think they go for an exile on the Lemure? Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, they do go for an exile, and all of a sudden, they're just up to a ton of life. At least I could have had a much better chance than I currently do if I 
had not attacked with the Lemur there, because I did think they could have had the Exile. Um, and because they have the Exile, they actually get to start clocking me with these small fools. Um, and I'm forced to make another tough decision here. So they go for untap, and I have to uh, fissure the 2-2 uh, the flyer. So yeah, that feels pretty bad. Um, like now I'm just behind in this race by a ton. I have to two for one myself to kill one of their threats and preserve my life total. Uh, and worst of all, if I just didn't make the attack with the Lemur, I could have been in okay shape. So I attack with both of my things. Um, I have to try to kill them in time here, which maybe is wrong. Um, because even pumping as much as I can, um, I mean, they, they still just have an extremely fast clock on me here. And they can just chump some of my stuff. So yeah, I should have just left the Lemur in play. Maybe attacked with the Dragon Engine later, but regardless, I, I just think I played that poorly. Su Chi. And now, because they're attacking with everything, uh, Su Chi is a lethal threat. Yeah, so again, Su Chi, lethal threat. They hit me down to four life, um, which means I have to leave the Dragon Engine back, that one in particular, to block. The reason being, um, I if I block with the Mountain Yeti, it actually doesn't trade because it only gets the plus four, plus zero um, when a creature is blocking it. So I make this attack, which is maybe a little dubious too. Yeah, in fact, this attack was pretty bad. Um, like, I'm not winning the game currently, but this attack basically was like the nail in the coffin because now what the opponent gets to do, they get to attack all. I have to trade with the Suchi. I go to one, and then even if I top deck Lightning Bolt, I still can't kill them. So, Actually, no, there is, <laughs> there is exactly one way that I can kill them, and it's if I top deck Lightning Bolt, they play like exactly Phantom Monster, um, they block my Mountain Yeti, and I can lethal the opponent. But yeah, um, I think main problems in this game, I just made two attacks that I didn't need to make, and if I hadn't made them, um, if I had just read, read them for an exile, um, they could have just effectively mulliganed, because again, the Yeti having pro-white, uh, pretty good against that kind of thing and even because like because it has trample as well the pro red creature is not very good against it um it does feel like they drew a little bit better than me here i did have to two for one myself with the paralyze and the fisher and i've got like one or two extra lands compared to them um but this was a rough game and i think i could have won it if i played it a little a little better a little differently um but I'm not sure. Maybe I'm being a little too hard on myself. It's definitely easy uh, watching this in retrospect to say, man, I really goofed that up. So anyway, thank you guys for watching. That's pretty much going to do it for me here. I am super dead. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this draft. Uh, I think I played most of it really well. And even though, again, uh, this game is a losing one, I think it could have been winnable. So Thanks for joining me for this Masters Draft. I'm going to be streaming on Twitch in the near future, uh, specifically more Masters Drafts, not to mention next week when uh, Standard Chaos comes out. I'm excited for that. So we'll see you again soon.